no means is it over. We can hack human beings and other organisms. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds. But you, the real you, your intelligence, your memory, your personality is going to live forever and ever. According to the Bible, you will never die. So the moment you bend your body for yoga, you are practicing Hindu. Elon Musk has now taken over Twitter. Pope says he wants everyone on Earth to show in the battle against yeah. climate change. Yeah. Free will, that's over. That's over. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm so happy to be here to talk about this topic. Uh, it's very personal, the battle for the, the, the frontal lobe. Uh, but I want to talk first about American society and the battle that we're facing today. Uh, March 8th of this year marked the 40th anniversary of President Ronald Reagan's evil empire speech. President Reagan forcefully described how murderous Soviet Marxism denied objective truth, crushed human freedom, and rejected God. It was a siren song for the internal threats that America is facing today. The liberal media during Reagan's day, they just couldn't handle it. They said he was being needlessly provocative and he lacked the flowery diplo speak. They wanted the nuance, the Beltway establishment, hedging language. They wanted some mealy mouth, shrinking violet in the White House who wouldn't dare to use the words like evil when speaking about geopolitics. Of course, many of those in the liberal press corps don't believe in God. So the notion of something being objectively evil is entirely foreign to them because they don't believe in objective truth or objective goodness. But Ronald Reagan was not afraid to speak the truth. And we are here today to talk about how to speak the truth without fear. And also, just as importantly, how to speak the truth in love. In his speech, Reagan quoted from Russian revolutionary murderer Vladimir Lenin, uh, Lenin who proclaimed that morality is entirely subordinate to the interests of class war. Everything is moral that is necessary for the annihilation of the old exploiting social order and for uniting the proletariat. As Lenin contrived his own morality, he and his ideological compatriots annihilated what they perceived as antiquated, dangerous vestiges of primitive human civilization. He used fear the opposite of love, the opposite of God, to enact his evil empire. The Soviets' blind zealotry emboldened them to commit mass murder through dehumanizing people who claimed traditional values, including people of faith. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Lenin's fruit was at least 20 million people starved and executed under the evil empire. Author David, Sat David Satter notes that if we add to this fruit the deaths caused by communist regimes that the Soviet Union created and supported, including those in Eastern Europe, China, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, and Cambodia, the total number of victims is closer to 100 million. That makes communism the greatest catastrophe in human history. Unfortunately, Lenin's American intellectual heirs are gaining ground in their desire to similarly dismantle what made America exceptional for centuries. America is exceptional because of our freedom, our public virtue, hard work, strong families, and civic engagement. Sadly, our core values are crumbling like never before. Though America's revolution is happening largely through internal decay, rather than violent coup, as in the Soviet Empire. Americans today, especially young people, believe patriotism, working hard, building a family, and community involvement are far less important than in eras past. This is according to a Wall Street Journal and University of Chicago poll that has been conducted each year for a quarter century in America. 38% of respondents said that patriotism is very important to them. That is a steep drop from the 70% who said that when the journal first asked the question in 1998. 
tolerance for others was very important for 80% of Americans as recently as only four years ago, and that's fallen to 58%. Only 23% of adults under age 30 said that having children is very important. A pollster who administered a previous version of this survey said that the differences are so dramatic, it paints a new and surprising portrait of a changing America. He added that the lowest economic confidence in decades is having a startling effect on our core values. The Soviet empire imposed economic central planning rather than embracing the God-given liberty of free economic exchange and private property that unleashed astonishing wealth for everyday people in America and elsewhere. America was founded on concepts of God-given rights, though those rights were imperfectly protected to be sure. We fought a bloody civil war to liberate those rights for black Americans, but we still were founded under in God we trust and the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that came from a divine creator, not from human authority, including a king or a central planning Marxist. In contrast, Lenin rejected any notion of divinity and supplanted God with materialism. Lenin said, we repudiate all morality that proceeds from supernatural ideas that are outside class conceptions. Can we talk about class warfare? And a similar materialism is creeping here into America. Shockingly, the only value that the Wall Street Journal tested that grew in importance in the last quarter century is the pursuit of money. That was cited as very important by 43% of Americans, up from 31% in 1998. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. America is suffering deep sorrows as depression and anxiety skyrocket. We are worshiping the false idol of wealth. Militantly atheist Lenin and the Communist Party demolished organized religion, executing tens of thousands of priests and other religious leaders, confiscating churches, and even boiling nuns alive in tar. Just 39% of Americans said religion is very important today, while in 1998, 62% said so. By ripping America's focus away from God and into materialistic class warfare, Lenin's American pals, they're winning. Sadly, as religious participation drops in America, suicide rises. Women who attend religious services at least once a week are 68% less likely to die from deaths of despair, including suicide, drug overdose, and alcohol poisoning. Men are 33% less likely to die, according to a 2020 research project led by the Harvard University School of Public Health. In January of this year, the National Bureau of Economic Research, also known as NBEAR, uh, issued a working paper that found states with pronounced drops in religious attendance correlated with sharper upticks in deaths of despair, and vice versa. Now, keep in mind that Ember is one of the most prominent economic research bodies in America, and it serves as the talent pool for many chairs of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. America's anti-religious decline is generally of a softer nature compared to Soviet Marxism, although in our social unrest, we've still seen billions of dollars in property damage and dozens of deaths from militant Black Lives Matter protests. They are led by people like BLM co-founder Patrice Couliers, who proudly calls herself a trained Marxist. And she says she thinks it's really cool that people think her book is like Mao's Red Book, although Mao's communist regime killed tens of millions of people. In the book of Genesis, the story of the twins Esau and, and the younger Jacob illustrates what's happening especially to America's youth. Esau despised his birthright, reads a passage about Esau when he traded his birthright, the patriarchal heritage and the blessing from God, for a stew that Jacob cooked. America's schools are teaching kids to despise their birthrights and in the process training them to hate and dehumanize each other through critical race theory. COVID-forced remote learning exposed what the schools are doing. They're establishing neo-racist, class-conscious, hierarchies of privilege that would make Lenin proud. Critical race theory stems from the 1930s era Marxist-inspired Frankfurt School in Germany. Its founders who created critical theory sought to dismantle capitalism and Western civilization, just as America's CRT does today. America's birthright is gifted through generations of warriors who defeated the evils of Nazism, Soviet communism, and the terror of the British monarchy. 
Like Lenin, America fought a revolution against monarchy. Goodbye, King George. But instead of a brutally atheistic, nihilistic regime, Americans created a system rooted in faith, God, family, and private property, along with free enterprise. Listen to this quote from George Washington in his farewell address. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest drop props of the duties of men and citizens. America needs a robust history lesson and spiritual revival to learn to cherish this birthright for generations to come. I'm grateful, Ivan, for inviting me here today under the theme of the battle for your frontal lobe. I'd like to share my personal battle, a raging battle that occurred in my brain for decades. While I'm still mortally flawed, I'm grateful that through God's liberation, I have largely won that battle. Second Corinthians tells us where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. God freed my might, and I know he can free all of us. What happens inside each American mind is what will determine the course of our country. I'm grateful that Hachette Book Group, which publishes authors like Ben Carson and Donald Trump Jr. accepted my memoir, that book cover here, it's called The Motorhome Prophecies, and I don't know, it's sprinkling with that, a journey of healing and forgiveness. The memoir is about how I escaped an abusive Mormon offshoot cult and the painful process of learning to live outside it after my parents disowned me. When I left the cult, my dad said my blood changed and I was no longer his daughter. My book is basically about sabotage. It's about sabotage from my father, sabotage from other people, and sabotage from myself, the kind that almost killed me. It's about how putting up fake fronts of perfectionism fatally is fatally toxic. This book is also about identifying and defeating sabotage, the kind that's destroying families and society. For many years, I expertly put up fake fronts, and most people were surprised to learn about my abusive, dysfunctional childhood. But all those fake fronts built up enormous pressure that eventually burst and landed me in the hospital nine times from complications to anxiety, depression, PTSD, fibromyalgia, and nearly two decades of episodic suicidal ideation. By the way, one of the hospitalizations was from hyponatremia, which is actually drinking too much water because <laughs> it makes your, uh, it makes your uh, sodium levels drop. And I've always had low sodium levels. And when I drank way too much water, I almost died because your brain needs the salt and your skull is fixed and it expands too much. So my little warning, but usually it's not enough water. <laughs> um, this book is about tearing down the false fronts, healing from the inside out, and coming to peace with God and forgiving others. Now, I'm not the hero of my book, but I am also not the villain. Even though for many years I struggled while painting myself in these absolutist black and white terms. God is the hero. And, through my, and though I thought that my father was the villain, I now see that he himself got crushed by severe zealotry that was sparked by mental illness after he suffered sexual assault as a toddler by a trusted babysitter. He also faced trauma from an attempted abduction by a stranger and a teacher who attempted to assault him as well. He also endured isolation and the sudden death of his childhood best friend in a sledding accident. Cambridge University shows that children who experienced multiple abuse, which is also known as complex abuse, or repetitive incidents of different types of abuses, are as much as five times more likely to attempt suicide. They say that time heals all wounds but sometimes it doesn't, at least here on this earth. That's why evil forces are attacking our children now in the most breathtakingly unbelievable ways. It's no wonder my dad felt despondent even as time passed since research shows that people who experience child abuse, when they grow up, the risk of suicide attempts actually increases. This is why Jesus said in Matthew that if any of you cause one of these little ones who believe me to stumble, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. In an eternal sense, yes, God heals all wounds, but during this broken moral existence, the scourge of childhood abuse compounds and is often passed on from one generation to the next. It takes enormous effort 
to break these chains of abuse and prevent the cycle from continuing. Now, growing up, my parents were on welfare and our family uh, that grew to eight children, seven biological siblings, lived in motorhomes, sheds, and tents. That includes one tent where my mother gave birth to my brother while our family was living in a campground in a tent. One of my two schizophrenic brothers sexually assaulted me and tried to rape me. The other schizophrenic brother accused me of trying to seduce him to have sex with me. And my dad believed his lie and said I dressed like a slut and I encouraged him. I attended homeschool plus 17 public schools, including two violent drug infested inner city schools where I was one of the only white kids and I was bullied for being white and my black friends were bullied for being friends with the white girl. At age 18, when I told my father I wanted to leave for college, he raised his hand to the square and he said, I prophesy in the name of Jesus that if you leave, you'll be raped and murdered. So I had a choice to leave, a choice to make, and I chose freedom. Now, despite the severe trauma and instability, I worked hard and I earned a, ma a master's in Har uh, a full tuition scholarship uh, to Harvard for a master's degree, and I later worked as a White House reporter. Uh, my book is about how I found peace within the faith of Christianity after nearly 12 years as an agnostic. And miraculously, I was finally able to forgive my father. The truth is, my father is just as deserving of God's mercy and compassion as I am. Now, I love my father, and I'm sorry that I waited so long to forgive him. He gave me a deep love of our exceptional country. He gave me love of beautiful music and intellectual inquiry. I know we've had many disagreements. I know in his heart that he has a deep desire to serve others through his work. I pray God's blessing on his life, especially as he struggles with Alzheimer's. And I'm grateful for the material we heard yesterday about Alzheimer's. Um, I'm also grateful to, th to my mother for her decades of selfless prayer for me, even when I didn't appreciate them. I know that God was listening. So if any of you have kids like that, keep praying. God's listening. My goal with this book is to show people that we live in an exceptional country, that we are not victims, that we are blessed with abundant freedoms, and that the circumstances of our birth do not determine the outcome of our lives. I'm excited to share this book with you next year. If you'd like to get my updates, I have a Substack newsletter. You can get uh, updates on there, and I look forward to connecting with you. Now, you might have heard the phrase, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. The West is committing suicide because it's turning away from God, which is the source of our wealth and our power. The West is doing this because we can, because we're getting soft and lazy. I would also argue it's also doing this because of bad examples from people who believe in God or say they believe in God. And this is the part where we as Christians must, must convict ourselves as we engage in our political debates and other conversations. We must speak the truth in love in order to persuade rather than dehumanize our political opponents. The truth is that religious people sometimes behave in most wretched fashion, from pedophile priests and pastors to bankrupting televangelists. It was the most religious people who used their political influence to get Jesus murdered. And it was the Apostle Judas, one of the first Christians, who lethally betrayed the Son of God. Human nature doesn't change, but God can change our nature. As, a fam as former slave-turned-abolitionist Frederick Douglass put it, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. As a Christian, I myself would be blind not to acknowledge my own flawed nature, my sharp tongue, and Embarrassing tweets sometimes in my temper make it a, me a terrible ambassador for Christ sometimes. Indeed, there is a cavernous difference between human-run religion and divine relationship. Our society today, uh, we see young people especially turning away from institutions. Trust across the board is crumbling, whether it's in government, schools, medicine, or religion. As someone deeply abused by very religious people who lived as an agnostic for almost 12 years, I thought that if God exists, he's probably a jerk because he allowed this to happen to me, or he's just indifferent, or he's someone who's proactively hurting me since people were using his name to do horrific things. The truth is, which I eventually learned, is that evil deeds done in God's name is like a knockoff Gucci purse with a big, big G on it. It's a fake, false, flim flimsy Im imitation. As conservatives, Faith over fear means speaking our truth in love. 
And that means that we encourage people and we don't harm them with our words. We want them to fear God, but not to fear us. As one of my mentors with the wonderful group Intercessors for America, I highly recommend them if you don't know them. They're a nationwide network and all they do is pray. Um, hundreds of thousands of people in every state. Um, she told me that the world says, shame on you, but God says, shame off of you. God is in the business of redeeming lives and removing shame. There's no shame in God's perfect love. Sometimes I hear conservatives mocking young people who are confused by all these crazy woke ideas. And some of them are really kooky. <laughs> but instead of bashing these young people, we must love them. When considering uh, offering feedback or correction, we must remember that Satan condemns, but God convicts. Jesus canceled sin, but he never canceled sinners. That evil empire speech by Ronald Reagan was before the National Association of Evangelicals. In another speech to that same group later on, he said, we must be cautious in claiming God is on our side. I think the real question we must answer is, are we on his side? And that's a question I'll be answering my entire life, and I hope you will as well. Thank you.